The Fur Country by Jules Verne. Part One, Chapter Seventeen. The Approach of Winter. It was the twenty-first of September. The sun was then passing through the autumnal equinox. That is to say, the day and night were of equal length all over the world. These successive alternations of light and darkness were hailed with delight by the inhabitants of the fort. It is easier to sleep in the absence of sun, and darkness refreshes and strengthens the eyes, weary with the unchanging brightness of several months of daylight. We know that during the equinox the tides are generally at their greatest height. We have high water or flood, for the sun and moon being in conjunction. Their double influence is brought to bear upon the waters. It was therefore necessary to note carefully the approaching tide at Cape Bathurst. Jasper Hobson had made benchmarks some days before, so as to estimate exactly the amount of vertical displacement of the waters between high and low tide. He found, however, that in spite of all the reports of previous observers, the combined solar and lunar influence. Was hardly felt in this part of the Arctic Ocean. There was scarcely any tide at all, and the statements of navigators on the subject were contradicted. There is certainly something unnatural here," said Lieutenant Hobson to himself. He did not, in fact, know what to think, but other cares soon occupied his mind, and he did not long endeavor to get to the rights of this singular peculiarity. On the twenty-ninth September. The state of the atmosphere changed considerably. The thermometer fell to forty-one degrees Fahrenheit, and the sky became covered with clouds, which were soon converted into heavy rain. The bad season was approaching. Before the ground should be covered with snow, Mrs. Joliffe was busy sowing the seeds of cochlearia, scurvy grass, and sorrel, in the hope that as they were very hardy. And would be well protected from the rigor of the winter by the snow itself. They would come up in the spring. Her garden, consisting of several acres, hidden behind the cliff of the cape, had been prepared beforehand, and it was sown during the last days of September. Hobson made his companions assume their winter garments before the great cold set in, and all were soon suitably clothed in the linen under vests. Deerskin cloaks, sealskin pantaloons, fur bonnets, and waterproof boots, with which they were provided. We may also say that the rooms were suitably dressed. The wooden walls were hung with skins in order to prevent the formation upon them of coats of ice in sudden falls of temperature. About this time, Ray set up his condensers for collecting the vapor suspended in the air, which were to be emptied twice a week. The heat of the stove was regulated according to the variations of the external temperature, so as to keep the thermometer of the rooms at fifty degrees Fahrenheit. The house would soon be covered with thick snow, which would prevent any waste of the internal warmth, and by this combination of natural and artificial protections, they hoped to be able successfully to contend with their two most formidable enemies, cold and damp. On the second October, the thermometer fell still lower, and the first snow came on. There was but little wind, and there were therefore none of those violent whirlpools of snow called drifts. But a vast white carpet of uniform thickness soon clothed the cape, the encant of fort and the coast. The waters off the lake and sea, not yet petrified by the icy hand of winter, were of a dull. Gloomy, greyish hue, and on the northern horizon, the first icebergs stood out against the misty sky. The blockade had not yet commenced, but nature was collecting her materials, soon to be cemented by the cold into an impenetrable barrier. The young ice was rapidly forming on the liquid surfaces of sea and lake. The lagoon was the first to freeze over. Large, whitish-gray patches. Appeared here and there, signs of a hard frost setting in, favored by the calmness of the atmosphere. And after a night during which the thermometer had remained at fifteen degrees Fahrenheit, the surface of the lake was smooth and firm enough 
to satisfy the most fastidious skaters of the serpentine. On the verge of the horizon, the sky assumed that peculiar appearance which whalers call ice blink, and which is the result of the glare of light reflected obliquely from the surface of the ice against the opposite atmosphere. Vast tracts of the ocean became gradually solidified. The ice fields, formed by the accumulation of icicles, became welded to the coast, presenting a surface broken and distorted by the action of the waves, and contrasting strongly with the smooth mirror of the lake. Here and there floated these long pieces, scarcely cemented together at the edges, known as drift ice, and the hummocks, or protuberances caused by the squeezing of one piece against another, were also of frequent occurrence. In a few days the aspect of Cape Bathurst and the surrounding districts was completely changed. Mrs. Barnett's delight and enthusiasm knew no bounds. Everything was new to her, and she would have thought no fatigue or suffering too great to be endured for the sake of witnessing such a spectacle. She could imagine nothing more sublime than this invasion of winter with all its mighty forces, this conquest of the northern regions by the cold. All trace of the distinctive features of the country had disappeared. The land was metamorphed. A new country was springing into being before her admiring eyes, a country gifted with a grand and touching beauty. Details were lost. Only the large outlines were given, scarcely marked out against the misty sky. One transformation scene followed another, with magic rapidity. The ocean, which but lately lifted up its mighty waves, was hushed and still. The verdant soil of various hues was replaced by a carpet of dazzling whiteness. The woods of trees of different kinds were converted into groups of gaunt skeletons, draped in hoar-frost. The radiant orb of day had become a pale disk. "'languidly running its allotted course in the thick fog, "'and visible for but a few hours a day, "'whilst the sea horizon, no longer clearly cut against the sky, "'was hidden by an endless chain of icebergs, "'broken into countless rugged forms, "'and building up that impenetrable ice-wall "'which nature has set up between the pole "'and the bold explorers who endeavour to reach it. "'We can well understand to how many discussions and conversations the altered appearance of the country gave rise. Thomas Black was the only one who remained indifferent to the sublime beauty of the scene. But what could one expect of an astronomer so wrapped up in his one idea that he might be said to be present in the little colony in the body but absent in spirit? He lived in the contemplation of the heavenly bodies, passing from the examination of one constellation to that of another, roving in imagination through the vast realms of space, peopled by countless radiant orbs, and fuming with rage when fogs or clouds hid the objects of his devotion from his sight. Hobson consoled him by promising him fine cold nights, admirably suited to astronomical observations, when he could watch the beautiful aurora borealis the lunar halos, and other phenomena of polar countries worthy of his admiration. The cold was not at this time too intense. There was no wind, and it was the wind which makes the cold so sharp and biting. Hunting was vigorously carried on for some days. The magazines became stocked with new furs, and fresh stores of provisions were laid up. Partridges and ptarmigans on their way to the south passed over the fort in great numbers, and supplied fresh and wholesome meat. Polar or arctic hares were plentiful, and had already assumed their white winter robes. About a hundred of these rodents formed a valuable addition to the reserves of the colony. There were also huge flocks of the whistling swan or hooper, one of the finest species of North America. The hunters killed several couples of them, Handsome birds, four or five feet in length, with white plumage, 
touched with copper color on the head and upper part of the neck. They were on their way to a more hospitable zone, where they could find the aquatic plants and insects they required for food, and they sped through the air at a rapid pace, for it is as much their native element as water. Trumpeter swans, with a cry like the shrill tone of a clarion, which are about the same size as the hoopers, but have black feet and beaks, also passed in great numbers. But neither Marbra nor Sabine were fortunate enough to bring down any of them. However, they shouted out, Au revoir! in significant tones, for they knew that they would return with the first breezes of spring, and that they could then easily be caught. Their skin, plumage, and down are all of great value, and they are therefore eagerly hunted. In some favorable years, tens of thousands of them have been exported, fetching half a guinea apiece. During these excursions, which only lasted for a few hours, and were often interrupted by bad weather, packs of wolves were often met with. There was no need to go far to find them, for, rendered bold by hunger, they already ventured close to the factory. Their scent is very keen, and they were attracted by the smell from the kitchen. During the night they could be heard howling in a threatening manner. Although not dangerous individually, these carnivorous beasts are formidable in packs, and the hunters therefore took care to be well armed when they went out beyond the encant of the fort. The bears were still more aggressive. Not a day passed without several of these animals being seen. At night they would come close to the enclosure, and some were even wounded with shot, but got off, staining the snow with their blood, so that up to October 10th not one had left its warm and valuable fur in the hands of the hunters. Hobson would not have molested them, rightly judging that with such formidable creatures it was best to remain on the defensive and it was not improbable that, urged on by hunger, they might attack Fort Hope before long. Then the little colony could defend itself, and provision its stores at the same time. For a few days the weather continued dry and cold. The surface of the snow was firm and suitable for walking, so that a few excursions were made, without difficulty, along the coast on the south of the fort. The lieutenant was anxious to ascertain if the agents of the St. Louis Fur Company had left the country. No traces were, however, found of their return march, and it was therefore concluded that they had gone down to some southern fort to pass the winter by another route. The few fine days were soon over, and in the first week of November the wind veered round to the south, making the temperature warmer, it is true, but also bringing heavy snowstorms. The ground was soon covered with a soft cushion, several feet thick, which had to be cleared away round the house every day, whilst a lane was made through it to the postern, the shed, and the stable of the dogs and reindeer. Excursions became more and more rare, and it was impossible to walk without snowshoes. When the snow has become hardened by frost, it easily sustains the weight of a man, but when it is soft and yielding, and the unfortunate pedestrian sinks into it to his knees, the snowshoes used by Indians are invaluable. Lieutenant Hobson and his companions were quite accustomed to walk in them, and could glide about over the snow as rapidly as skaters on ice. Mrs. Barnett had early practiced wearing them, and was quite as expert in their use as the rest of the party. The frozen lake as well as the coast were scoured by these indefatigable explorers, who were even able to advance several miles from the shore on the solid surface of the ocean, now covered with ice several feet thick. It was, however, very tiring work, for the ice fields were rugged and uneven, strewn with piled-up ridges of ice and hummocks, which had to be turned. Further out, a chain of icebergs, some five hundred feet high, barred their progress. These mighty icebergs 
broken into fantastic and picturesque forms, were a truly magnificent spectacle. Here they looked like the whitened ruins of a town, with curtains battered in, and monuments and columns overthrown. There, like some volcanic land, torn and convulsed by earthquakes and eruptions, a confusion of glaciers and glittering ice-peaks, with snowy ramparts and buttresses, valleys and crevices, mountains and hillocks, tossed and distorted like the famous Alps of Switzerland. A few scattered birds, petrels, guillemots, and puffins, lingering behind their fellows, still enlivened the vast solitude with their piercing cries. Huge white bears roamed about amongst the hummocks, their dazzling coats scarcely distinguishable from the shining ice. Truly, there was enough to interest and excite our adventurous lady traveller, and even Madge, the faithful Madge, shared the enthusiasm of her mistress. How far, how very far, were both from the tropic zones of India or Australia. The frozen ocean was firm enough to have allowed of the passage of a park of artillery, or the erection of a monument, and many were the excursions on its surface until the sudden lowering of the temperature rendered all exertion so exhausting that they had to be discontinued. The pedestrians were out of breath after taking a few steps, and the dazzling whiteness of the glittering snow could not be endured by the naked eye. Indeed, the reverberation or flickering glare of the undulatory reflection of the light from the surface of the snow has been known to cause several cases of blindness amongst the Eskimo. A singular phenomenon, due to the refraction of rays of light, was now observed. Distances, depths, and heights lost their true proportions. Five or six yards of ice looked like two, and many were the falls and ludicrous results of this optical illusion. On October 14th, the thermometer marked three degrees Fahrenheit below zero, a severe temperature to endure, especially when the north wind blows strongly. The air seemed to be made of needles, and those who ventured out of the house were in great danger of being frostbitten. When death or mortification would ensue, if the suspended circulation of the blood were not restored by immediate friction with snow, Gary, Belche, Hope, and other members of the little community were attacked by frostbite. But the parts affected, being rubbed in time, they escaped without serious injury. It will be readily understood that all manual labor had now become impossible. The days were extremely short. The sun was only above the horizon for a few hours, and the actual winter implying entire confinement within doors, was about to commence. The last Arctic birds forsook the gloomy shores of the polar seas. Only a few pairs of those speckled quails remained, which the Indians appropriately call winter birds, because they wait in the Arctic regions until the commencement of the polar night. But they too were soon to take their departure. Lieutenant Hobson, therefore, urged on the setting of the traps and snares, which were to remain in different parts of Cape Bathurst throughout the winter. These traps consisted merely of rough joists, supported on a square, formed of three pieces of wood, so balanced as to fall on the least touch, in fact, the same sort of trap as that used for snaring birds in fields on a large scale. The end of the horizontal piece of wood was baited with venison, and every animal of a moderate height, a fox or a marten, for instance, when touched it with its paw, could not fail to be crushed. Such were the traps set in winter over a space of several miles by the famous hunters whose adventurous life has been so poetically described by Cooper. Some thirty of these snares were set around Fort Hope and were to be visited at pretty frequent intervals. On the 12th November, a new member was born to the little colony. Mrs. McNabb was safely confined of a fine healthy boy, of whom the head carpenter was extremely proud. 
Mrs. Barnett stood godmother to the child, which received the name of Michael Hope. The ceremony of baptism was performed with considerable solemnity, and a kind of fete was held in honor of the little creature which had just come into the world beyond the seventieth degree north latitude. A few days afterwards, on November twentieth, the sun sank below the horizon, not to appear again for two months. The polar night had commenced. End of chapter seventeen.